of a PhD thesis getting a Turing Award, right? So there are all those students out there aiming for ACM India Doctoral Dissertation Award. Here is an inspiration to aim higher. Bob uh, also has uh, several linear time algorithms to his credit. You may not know that the linear time median finding algorithm, which we teach in the first course as a classic example of uh, divide and conquer paradigm, has uh, Bob's contribution in it. Bob also uh, realized the role of data structures in the design of algorithms, uh, apart from designing a number of interesting data structures for his very specific applications. He uh, identified that the worst case complexity is not necessarily a good measure to analyze uh, algorithms on data structures. Rather, he pioneered this notion of amortized computational complexity on data structures. And this led to an analysis of you know, disjoint union find data structure, right? So he brought the inverse Ackerman from nowhere in that analysis. Uh, splay trees, which can do whatever a balanced binary search trees can do, and even better. And uh, Fibonacci heaps, which continues to be the best data structure for the best implementation of the classical Dijkstra shortest paths algorithm or prim spanning tree algorithm. Along with uh, Slater, he also initiated the area of online algorithms and this notion of competitive ratio. He has worked in a number of related areas in data structures, including persistent data structures and concurrent data structures. For his work on uh, advancement in these data structures and algorithms, he has won this. He became an ACM fellow in 1994, and he won the first Neven Lina Prize given by the International Congress of Mathematical Union. I mentioned about his quest for linear time algorithm, but the other theme in his work has been also that an algorithm should not only be efficient, but also be simple. And that, I believe, is the theme of his talk today. So please join me in welcoming Bob Tarjan. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to see all of you here today. Uh, this is my first visit to India, but it certainly won't be my last. So thanks for your hospitality, and let me thank all the organizers. Now, uh, I'm on the latter half of my career here, at least. So let me begin with a few, uh, if we can get this to work. A few general observations. Uh, computer science is a young field. You know, I've been in it for most of its existence, actually. I got my PhD in 1972. Uh, and most of the algorithms that we know have been developed over that period of time and starting actually right after World War II. Over the last 60, 70 years, computer scientists have discovered many amazing results, many efficient algorithms and data structures, but it's still a young field. This is not mathematics where the results go back to Euclid. And it's a very rich field. And because it's so young, we often settled for the first, the good enough solution, but not necessarily the best one. The design space is incredibly rich and it gets even richer as computers become faster and we get larger memories and we get multiprocessors. On the other hand, so it's easy to come up with complicated methods, but we want to come up with methods that are actually usable in practice. So my goal recently has been trying to extract simplicity, design the simplest possible algorithms for even the most basic problems Paul Erdos, who was a well-known mathematician, passed away now, but his idea was uh, there are proofs of mathematical theorems that come from the book. That would be the book upstairs. Uh, the right proof. 
Let's think about the same concept in algorithms design. Can we come up with the right algorithm, the one that is exactly right, that uses the minimum amount of information and is efficient as possible? Provable resource bounds for important classes of inputs and efficient in practice as well as in theory. Can we make everything as simple as possible but not too simple? This is a quote attributed to Einstein. Now sometimes simplicity is not just useful but it's critical in particular in concurrent algorithms in which you have multiple processors interacting. And if it's complicated enough to understand what one processor is doing, if we have multiple processors doing things to a data structure simultaneously, keeping track of things is incredibly complicated. So even proving correctness is a challenge, let alone getting a simple algorithm. So simplicity plays a crucial role there. So I'd like to illustrate this idea of simple algorithms in the context of a very basic data structure, the binary search tree. I'm going to talk about two types of binary search trees which have different properties and different purposes, one of which is the splay tree, which Danny Slater and I invented in 1983, um, which have this notion of self-adjusting and amortized efficiency embedded in them. That's an old result, but it illustrates some of these points. And the second one I'm going to call the zip tree, which is I will formulate it as a new idea, but it takes a lot of old ideas and synthesizes them in what I think is a nice way. It uses randomization. So let's review our basic undergraduate data structures a little bit and think about the problem of a dictionary. We want to store a set of items with associate information so we can look up individual items and report back the information associated with the items. So the access operation is crucial. But we also want to be able to update the dictionary. We want to be able to add new items to it. And we want to be able to delete old items. So we're thinking about a dynamic dictionary. These are the three critical operations. I'll mention a couple of others. All right. So the first, perhaps most obvious solution is to just store the items in a list, which could be an array. To find an item, we just walk down the list until we come to the item and report back. That's very simple, but it's not very efficient because the search time can be linear in the length of the list. And if items are equally likely to be accessed, the expected number of steps you have to go is halfway down the list to find an item. That's not very uh, efficient. It works for tables of small size, and it's been used in many places. But as soon as the tables start to get significantly larger, it's not a good solution. Another possibility that does use randomization is the hash table, which is just a map which maps all possible data items into a small space. And as long as we can compute the map efficiency, we can get direct access to any individual item that gives us constant lookup time. We have to deal with the issue of collisions, and there's a vast literature about collisions and hash tables and how to design them. But one additional problem is that hashing scrambles things, so we immediately lose any information about order. If the items happen to be naturally ordered in some way, uh, we can't exploit the order in a hash table. A nice compromise is the search tree. We get not constant lookup time, but logarithmic lookup time, which is an exponential improvement over linear. And it does preserve order, which means we can do things, not only individual lookups, but we can do things like range queries, report the set of items between two given uh, keys, let us say. Or we can do position queries. We can look up, say, the tenth item in a ordered list or the millionth item in an ordered list if we keep appropriate information around. Okay, now how does binary search work? Once upon a time, phone numbers were in telephone books, these huge paper things that you want to look up a phone number. You open it up to the middle. You see if the name that you're looking for is before the place you 
are at or after the place you are at and you search either in the one half or in the other half correspondingly each step in your search has the number of possibilities so the number of steps in the search is logarithmic in the number of data items and here's some approximation to a program to do binary search if we want to find an element x in an ordered set if the set is empty we stop and declare that it's not in the set if it's non-empty, we compare x to some item that's in the set, and if, the, if we found the item, we stop, we have success. We assume the items are totally ordered according to some order, alphabetic in the case of words, or numeric in the case of numbers, or lexicographic in the case of strings. If the item we're looking for is smaller than the, the item that we have found in the set, we have to search the first half, and otherwise we search the the last half, and if we pick the item Y in the middle, each step has the total number of items in our set, so after a logarithmic number of steps, we've found our item. A binary search tree is just a data structure that implements this idea of binary search. So it's a tree, a binary tree. Every node has two children, a left child and a right child, either or both which can be missing. Each node contains one item along with associated information. This tree and my pointer is not working but this tree contains letters and the critical thing about the tree is that the letters are arranged in symmetric order which means that everything in the left subtree of a node is smaller and everything in the right subtree of a node is larger. Now I've captured some of the definitions. Oh, turned off. Okay, so here's binary search tree. F is the root. Everything in the left subtree is smaller than F in alphabetical order. Everything in the right subtree is bigger and that property holds in lower levels of the tree. So this just repeats what I've said. A node can either has two children or one child or no children. We think of the missing children as being null or missing. I'll denote by n the total number of nodes in the tree. Uh, the depth is just the number of edges on the path from a given node, from the root down to a given node. That's counting down from the top. And the height counts up from the bottom. The size is just the number of nodes in the tree. To represent a binary search tree in the computer, we just have a pointer from each node to its left child, a pointer to its right child, and possibly some additional information. The data associated with the item may be a pointer to the parent, maybe information about the height or the depth of the node, maybe something having to do with some other properties like something that I'll call the rank eventually. And a binary search tree is just a binary tree in which the items are stored in the node in symmetric order with respect to some ordering of the, the items. Okay, again, symmetric order, otherwise called in order, is illustrated again in this tree. Everything in the left subtree of a node is less, everything in the right subtree of a node is bigger. This makes binary search easy to search for P, for example. We start at the root F, it's bigger, we branch to the right, it's bigger than M, we branch to the right, it's smaller than X, we branch to the left, and then we find it. Four steps. So the search time is proportional to the path length in the tree, and our goal is to minimize the path length. The best case is where all the leaves, all the nodes with no children are on two all on the bottom level, which is not always possible, are all within one level of each other. And then we get essentially the binary log of n as the depth of the tree, and that's the search time. So if we have a static set of data, we can build the best case tree and then use it for all our searches. But as I said, we want to consider the possibility of doing insertions and deletions. We could completely rebuild the tree after every insertion or deletion, but this is linear time. If we're dealing with a tree with billions of nodes in it, this is completely infeasible. We, so we want to approximate the best case here somehow, preserve the logarithmic search 
with fast updates. That's the challenge. Now, uh, let's make this challenge more concrete. The standard way to insert an item into a binary search tree is to search for it. The search drops off the bottom of the tree and we just insert the new item in the place where we drop off the bottom of the tree. So in this example, if we want to insert R, the search path is F, it's bigger, so we go to M to the right, bigger we go to X, smaller we go to P, bigger we fall off the bottom of the tree, and we insert X, uh, we insert R in this position, like so. All well and good, except if we start with an empty tree and we start doing insertions in a natural order, let us say sorted order, smallest to largest, this is the best case again, this is our ideal, we get this tree. So if we start with an empty tree and we insert A, it becomes the root, we insert B, it becomes the right child of the root, we insert C, it becomes the right child of B, and so on. We get the same behavior as a linear list. This is a situation we want to avoid. Not only is this the worst case, but it's a natural case. You can expect that in some data sets they will be inserted in close to sorted order and then you have to deal with this. This is not an obscure case. This is a very natural case. So we've got to eliminate this case somehow. The classical way to do this, which I'll rapidly review, is to do some kind of rebalancing. Uh, the original kind of balanced trees are the AVL trees. AVL stands for Adelson Velsky, that's one name, and Landis, a Russian who introduced this idea in 1961, 1962. The English translation of their paper is only four pages. It's very telegraphic, but it inc introduces this key idea. Um, since the introduction of AVL trees. There are dozens, if not many, more kinds of balanced trees that have been introduced, notably red-black trees and generalizations of AVL trees. And I'll quickly mention how this works. This is the classical approach. Guarantee T is logarithmic access time, logarithmic insertion time, and logarithmic deletion time. After I do this review, which is undergraduate computer science, I want to talk about alternative approaches that give both simplicity and additional properties of different sorts. Those are the splay trees and the zip trees. Okay, so what does a balanced tree do? It maintains some kind of local balance condition. The, the intuitive idea is that you want to heap the two halves, the left subtree and the right subtree under any node, somehow the same, either the same size roughly or the same maximum path length. So the AVL tree idea tries to keep the maximum path length, the heights or the depths going down on both sides roughly the same. And in particular, they have to be within one of each other in an AVL tree. Anyway, there's some kind of local balance condition that guarantees logarithmic height, so logarithmic access time, and that is easy to restore after an insertion or a deletion. I didn't explain how deletions work. They're a little bit more complicated than insertions. But we have to do some local changes to the tree structure when we do insertions and deletions to restore the balance property. <laughs> And those local changes are called re rotations. In the original formulation, if you look in Knuth, there's a single rotation and a double rotation, but a double rotation is really two single rotations. So one rotation is enough to be universal. And how does that look? It looks like this. The idea here is that if, if X is too deep, we can move it up a level by exchanging it with its parent and if it is the left child of its parent, the parent becomes the right child. And the three subtrees here get attached in the correct left to right order. So this preserves symmetric order, which preserves the search property. Changes three pointers in the tree, so we can do it in constant time. And by doing enough rotations, we can restructure the tree to make it balanced if it becomes unbalanced. So depending upon the exact definition of the balance condition, you can either rebalance 
bottom up, which is the way things work in AVL trees, or sometimes uh, pre preemptively, top down. That is, as you walk down the tree and you know you're going to do an insertion, you do some rotations to fix things up as you go along, and you also correct the local or update the local balance information, whatever it might be. That is, in AVL trees, you're representing the heights somehow. Okay, so uh, there are many height balance trees, notably the AVL trees, the red-black trees, and other versions. And you can also use a weight balance condition where you try to keep subtree sizes close to each other. Uh, BB alpha trees, scapegoat trees, many examples. Here is a picture of an AVL tree. Uh, the original definition of AVL trees used a, 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 a three possible states at each node, uh, minus one, plus one, and zero. This is an implicit representation of the maximum path length. An AVL tree requires that the maximum path down the left subtree has to be either equal to the maximum path length down the right subtree, or they have to be within one of each other. So a plus one denotes that the right subtree is one deeper, and a minus one denotes that the left subtree is one deeper, and a zero denotes that the maximum path lengths down both paths are exactly the same. You can update these, so th these plus minus ones, this is an efficient way of representing path lengths and it can be updated on the fly as you're doing rotations. So what happens is if you stick something down a plus one path, you need to walk back up the path and do some rotations to fix things up and recorrect the balance information. Now it happens that in AVL trees you can get away with just a single or one or two rotations on insertion and some corrections to the balance information. The lesions are more complicated. Um, it takes up to a logarithmic number of rotations uh, and the deletion algorithm for AVL trees was actually described in a mm, maybe 50 page technical paper by an American aerospace engineer much after the, um, the original AVL tree paper, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in any case, with all these balanced tree structures, the restructuring only takes place along the access path, so it takes logarithmic time, and it might be a constant number of rotations, might be a logarithmic number of rotations, that's all in the details. Here is a picture of a red-black tree. This was a notion, actually this goes back to Bayer, but um, um, he called them symmetric binary B trees, I think. This is an illustration of coming up with a good name for your data structure. There's a nice conference paper by uh, uh, Leo Gibas, who's at Stanford, and Bob Sedgwick, who's my colleague at Princeton, called a dichromatic framework for balanced trees in which they introduced this notion of red-black trees. And it was so compelling that people really uh, adapted it, even though the idea uh, predates them. In any case, the idea here is that uh, the red nodes allow flexibility so you can rebalance, and the black nodes give the underlying structure of the tree. The requirements are the number of black nodes along any path from top to bottom is the same, no matter what path you take. And no red node has a red parent. So in a sense, these are half path balanced trees in the sense that the number of nodes on any path is either equal to the number of black nodes, that's the minimum case, or it could be as many as twice the number of black nodes if it alternates red, black, red, black. Uh, red, black trees are a little bit more flexible than AVL trees. They can be updated top down as well as bottom up. If you do the operations correctly and you do them bottom up, you can do rotations, uh, up to three rotations per deletion, up to two rotations per insertion. So this is a very nice data structure and you will probably have seen one or the other or both of these in your undergraduate data structure course. All right, that's the classical approach. Now what's the problem with balanced trees? Well, one problem is you have to do exactly the right thing to do the updating and it depends upon the local configuration and there generally are uh, about six cases on insertion and 
eight cases in deletion, and to do the implementation, you gotta get all the cases right. And one thing that happened historically is that deletion gets kind of ignored in textbooks, so people tend to get it wrong when they actually try to go do it. Uh, complexity, right? We're going for simplicity. You also have to store the balance information, but with AVL trees, it's only two bits per node. With red black trees, it's one bit per node. You can get away with one bit for AVL trees, but you still have to preserve the balance information. And all of these data structures are designed to minimize the worst case access time and the worst case insertion deletion time. Is this the right measure of complexity? Can we, by looking at the problem differently, uh, possibly uh, change things, overcome some of these drawbacks if you see them as drawbacks? Now, um, these data structures are designed, again, to optimize the worst case, but they're assuming uniform access. What happens if the access pattern is skewed somehow? For example, certain items are much more frequently accessed than others. Intuitively, you would like them to be close to the top of the tree so they're to uh, cheap to access and you wanna push down the infrequently accessed ones. Or what happens if, for example, the items at the very first part of the list are more frequently accessed or the items at the back part of the list are more frequently accessed, then you'd like to adjust the tree somehow to make the front part more shallow or the back part more shallow. So uh, Danny Slater, Danny was a graduate student of mine at Stanford and we were working on network flow algorithms and we eventually reduced the maximum flow problem to essentially a data structure problem in which we had to be able to design a different kind of dynamic tree. And we observed that um, in this application and in many others, you are not necessarily interested in the individual time per operation, you're interested in the total time for a sequence of operations. So you're willing to pay, you're willing to have certain operations be expensive if they're balanced out by lots of cheap operations. So why shoot for the worst case? Is it possible, for example, to design a data structure that kind of adapts to its usage it minimizes the total time of the operations and if certain, in the search tree for example, if certain items are much more frequently accessed than others, you get the benefit of that somehow. Now there was a very simple historical example of this kind of data structure, the self-adjusting list and the move to front rule, uh, which is similar to uh, first in, first out paging last in, first out paging, least recently used, least recently used, yeah, right. So you wanna kick a page out of main memory. Which one do you kick out? You kick out the page that's been accessed farthest in the past. That's the idea. Move to front list rearrangement. The idea is every time you access an item, you move it to the front of the list. So if it's accessed again soon, it will be very cheap to access. Can we come up with a similar scheme for binary search trees? And the answer is after playing around with some things that don't work, we came out with something that does work. What are the advantages of such a thing? We get rid of this complicated rebalancing. We don't need to keep track of balance information. And more importantly, perhaps the tree adjusts to match its usage and maybe we can capture that in a theorem. The data structure we came up with we called the splay tree. Splay as a verb means to spread out and you'll see uh, how that idea comes into play in the, in the data structure. This is an artist, this is George Solfi. He drew this picture for my touring lecture. This is a self-adjusting search tree or self-adjusting tree. It doesn't have to be a search tree. All right. So the idea here is that every time we do an access, we're gonna perform rotations along the access path that move the accessed item all the way to the root. If it is accessed, that means that if it's accessed again soon, it's gonna be cheap to access. That's the intuition. But we don't do it by simply rotating one at a time 
bottom up or one at a time, top down. We do it depending upon the local structure because if you do it one at a time in either direction, it doesn't work. And, and here are the rules. Uh, we're accessing item X. If, here's the trivial case, if we're one step away from the root, we just rotate X to the root and then we're done. If we're two steps away from the root, what we do depends upon whether the two steps alternate. This is a right child of a left child or symmetrically a left child of a right child or the other way around. In this case, the, we do the two rotations in the obvious order, which is bottom up. So we rotate X above Y and then rotate X above Z and we transform into this picture. And then we keep going up the path. This is the anomalous case, the zig-zig case. If, if the current node X is a left child of a left child or symmetrically a right child of a right child, we rotate Y up and then we rotate X up and the local transformation turns into this. Now this kind of looks like it produces more balance. This case doesn't obviously make things more balanced. It just kind of flips things over. But when you start doing these things in sequence, um, interesting things happen. So for example, if we start out with this hideous tree, which is just a single path, and we do access on item four here. This is the pure zigzag case. Four moves up to the five position and three and five get split four moves up to the six position and two and six get split. Finally, four moves up here. So this is three zigzag steps. This entire process is a splay. The net outcome is that four moves to the root and this path gets split into two pieces, the left part and the right part. The, the pure opposite case is the pure zigzag case. This is the more interesting one, perhaps. So again, we start with a really bad tree, just a single long path. Access item one, this part flips over, one moves up two steps. This part flips over, one moves up two steps. This part flips over, one moves up two steps. These nodes along this path get paired up. So everything on this whole access path moves up roughly a factor of two. So not only does node one get the benefit of moving all the way to the root, but all these nodes move up. Their depths get roughly halved. And no node in the tree gets pushed down by more than an additive constant. So this is very simple to program. It's a very simple idea. And given a move to root rearrangement uh, algorithm like this, you can easily implement insertion and deletion and other things like splitting a tree or merging two trees. To access an item, we follow the search path, insert the item where we fall off the tree, and then splay at the new node that moves it all the way to the root. To, uh, to access an item, we search for it and we splay it, move it all the way to the root. To delete an item, we follow the search path we want to remove the item and then we have to fill in the hole. There are various ways to do it, but one is to continue down to the bottom and to splay at the bottom node in effect and put the tree back together. Now, now the question is how efficient is this data structure? Well, we were able to prove that uh, even though an individual operation can take linear time, because you can do sequences of accesses that will create arbitrary trees, which means arbitrary bad trees. So you can have linear time operations, but they happen very rarely. If you start with an empty tree and do an arbitrary sequence of insertions, deletions, and accesses, the total time is the same as what happens in balanced trees, namely the number of operations times a logarithm. And here, this would be the average number of nodes in the tree. We could have a more complicated representation. But there's no explicit balancing going on. This happens automatically. Furthermore, there are much stronger properties. You can prove things about what happens if items are more frequently accessed than others. 
Um, uh, if you know ahead of time the access frequencies of all your items, you can build a static optimum tree, which among fixed trees minimizes the total access time. Splay trees come within a constant factor of the optimum static tree on any access sequence, even though they don't know the frequencies. And there are other spatial and time locality properties that splay trees exploit that we can prove results about. In fact, the conjecture, the audacious conjecture that we came up with, which was based upon a, a theorem that we could prove for linear lists, move to front for linear lists, is that this is essentially the best possible algorithm in some sense. This is the algorithm from the book in the following setting. Take an arbitrary initial binary search tree. You have to do an arbitrary access sequence. You know ahead of time the entire access sequence. Your cost per access is the depth of the access node. Anytime you want, you can do a rotation at a constant cost. Your cost on any access sequence with the best possible algorithm, knowing everything, does not beat the splay algorithm by more than a constant factor. This conjecture has been open for the last 30 years. Interesting progress has been made on it. Um, I look forward to seeing somebody prove it or disprove it. This is my favorite open problem in data structures. So even though there are lots of data structures, I don't necessarily recommend this one for you budding computer scientists. What you really want is a problem that goes off in another direction. You want to work on something that somebody, nobody else has thought about. There's been too much work on this. It's, it's like what Marty said this morning, right? They had this crazy notion of public key cryptography. They had the field wide open. That's what you want, a wide open field. Uh, okay, so this works really well. It's a very practical data structure. It has been used in many applications. Uh, we got the Paris Conolacus Prize for this data structure, which is given for results in theory that have practical applications. But um, this has its own limitations. For one thing, you're doing lots and lots of rotations. Every time you do an access, you're restructuring the tree. The root is a hot spot. Let's think about a scenario in which you have not one, but multiple processors accessing the tree at the same time or updating the tree at the same time. There's going to be a hot spot at the root for all the insertions and deletions. Everybody's going to bump into each other. And even for the accesses, if we're always doing move to root here. So this is not a satisfactory data structure in a concurrent setting. What might be a nice data structure in a concurrent setting? I want something that gives logarithmic access. I won't worry for the moment about um, different access probability, so I'm happy with log n. But I want something very simple and that has the potential to be implementable in a concurrent setting, multiprocessor setting. So we're looking at a different corner of the design space. And the idea is going to be to use randomization in a nice way. Uh, so, and another thing I want to do in this is throw out the idea of rotations as the way we're going to update the search tree because rotations lead to lots of cases and that gets complicated. Can we do things more simply? All right, so here's a picture I found on the web. This is a a tree with a zipper, a zip tree, right? So zip means to move fast, and it also, you unzip a zipper and you zip a zipper, and this is gonna describe how we're doing insertions and deletions. So everything is captured in the name, or at least I hope it is. What is the idea? <coughs> the idea is we wanna mimic the behavior of the best possible tree, the perfectly balanced tree. So the perfectly balanced tree has half its nodes at level zero, a quarter of the nodes at level one, an eighth of the nodes at level two, and so on. 
the number of nodes decreases by a power of two, by a factor of two each time we go up a level. I want to reproduce that behavior, but be able to do insertions and deletions cheaply. So the idea is to pick a height for an item when we insert it and to make sure that it goes in at the correct height. And we'll choose the heights randomly to match the distribution in the perfect tree. That is, uh, with factor of two, you get height zero. With factor of, uh, I'm sorry, probability of half, you get height zero. Probability of quarter, you get height one. Probability of an eighth, you get height two, and so on. Now, we can't pick the exact height, but we can approximate this idea, and this leads to this data structure. So when we're going to insert a node, we're going to give it a rank, which is a proxy for the height, which we generate by flipping a fair coin according to the geometric distribution. We count the heads until we hit the first tail. So with probability of half, the rank is zero. With probability of quarter, the rank is one. With probability of an eighth, the rank is two, and so on. The data structure, the nodes are symmetri symmetrically arranged with respect to the, the values, the keys, and heap ordered with respect to the ranks, max heap ordered. That means for every node, its children have smaller rank. And we break, tie we break ties by choosing uh, in favor of smaller key, although this decision is completely arbitrary. Okay. So if we choose a rank for every node, and every node has a key, there is a unique tree structure that satisfies these requirements. This is the zip tree notion statically. So here's a picture of one. We can have rank ties, but we're always breaking the rank ties in favor of the smaller key value. So F and P are both three, that's the biggest rank. F is the root because it wins over P because it has smaller key. We got a tie at one here. Maybe that's all the ties. So if you walk down a left path, the ranks strictly decrease and there could be gaps, but there won't be too many gaps because of the probability distribution. So we get a fair number of zeros and more ones than twos and threes. This We get a, a balanced structure, apparently. How do we do insertions into this structure? The idea is we got to preserve the heap order. Now, there is one way to do it, which is to use rotations. When we insert a new item, we walk to the bottom of the tree, stick it in, and do rotations to re uh, rearrange things to get the heap order. That is, a, a node has a high rank, it needs to move up to the right position. But let's forget about rotations, let's do it differently. How would we insert a node in the root, for example, as the new root if we wanted to? Turns out um, Stevenson in 1980 wrote a paper that describes how to do this. The idea is we want to insert the item in the root. We walk down the entire path, the search path, and split it into the nodes that are smaller than the given node and the ones that are larger than the given node. And that gives us two paths. And we just attach those two paths to the new node. And that tells us how to split the tree. A picture is better than a description in this purpose. So if I want to insert N here. I walk down the search path, which is F, P, H, M. F and H are smaller, and P and M are larger. I restructure appropriately. I'm calling that unzipping the search path, or unmerging, if you prefer. And that's the new tree. Now, what we want to do is insert an item at a given rank, which could be small, which could be large. This is going to be a hybrid of leaf and root insertion. So we walk down to the correct level to insert the new node. We unzip the remaining path, reattach the two resulting paths, and then we're done. Here's a description in words. A picture illustrates this point better. If I want to insert J, I start doing coin flipping. I get a rank of two. 
I start searching. Uh, the rank is smaller than that of F, so we branch right and keep going. The rank is smaller than that of P, so we branch left and keep going. It has rank bigger than that of H, which is one. So we know that it's gonna be the, left, the new left child of P. The remaining search path is HM, both of which, well, J goes in between. So the HM path is gonna split into H on the left and M on the right. We unzip that path and we end up with the correct tree. Okay. So again, to insert a new item, we just generate a rank randomly. We follow the search path to the correct level. We unzip the remaining part of the search path, glue the pieces back together, and we're done. Deletion is just the inverse of insertion. Deletion becomes equally simple to insertion. And the idea is pretty straightforward. We just search for the item. We want to remove it. Then we zip together the path down to its successor and the path down to its predecessor. So if we want to delete P, for example, in this picture, we remove it, we get a hole. The predecessor, which is found by taking one left step and going down to the bottom, taking right paths, right, right steps is M. The successor is Q. We remove P, we zip together these two paths. So we merge the paths by rank, small, largest to smallest with smaller key winning. So J is on top, then X, then M, then R, then Q. And the top node, which is gonna be J here, replaces the P. So that's, P is gonna go away. We zip together the two paths and then we're done. That's the whole data structure. Now what can we say about this? The expected rank of the root is logarithmic. This is a ba base two logarithm of n plus a little constant. The root rank is order log n with high probability. And the number of ties is expected to be small. Basically you can have, the, the average number of ties is gonna be one per node. You can prove that the expected node depth is 1.5 times log n, that's actually the binary log of n, plus a constant. The tree depth is logarithmic with high probability. So we get all the properties of balanced trees with this idea of randomization, with small constant factors. We get an extra property, which is that the tree structure is uniquely determined by the ranks, which means that if you insert something and delete it, there's no evidence that it was ever there. You get a history independent data structure, which uh, some people have argued is useful in certain privacy preserving situations. It may well be a nice property to have, but not the most important property. Um, what can we say about the time for insertion and deletion? Well, uh, it's obviously logarithmic by the previous results, but we can say something much stronger. Half the time the rank is zero, that means half the time the node goes at the bottom or within one of the bottom, that's constant time. A quarter of the time is rank one, it's gonna take an extra step. Uh, the average restructuring time per insertion or deletion is just constant. And the probability of taking K steps, restructuring steps, after an insertion or deletion is exponentially small in K. So all the restructuring or most of the restructuring is happening at the bottom of the tree. Now this is especially appealing in a concurrent situation. If you have multiple threads running down the tree and they're operating in different places, um, they're never gonna interfere with each other. As long as they're not touching the same nodes, all is good. One can get the same properties for certain kind of balanced trees, notably red black trees and some others, but the analysis gets rather complicated and the, the cases again are, are kind of annoying. So we get a lot of these results if we're willing to live with the randomization um, in a simple way. Now, I mentioned that this is not really a 
new data structure. Other people have suggested this notion of uh, a randomized search tree with nodes having uh, ranks or priorities and things being heap ordered with respect to priorities. Uh, notably, Aragon and Seidel, who called their data structure a treep, they chose their priorities from a space that's large enough to eliminate ties. But you don't really need to, that is rank ties in our setting, but rank ties don't affect things at all. Um, the fact that we allow rank ties costs us a little bit in the constant factor in the expected depth. Uh, their bound is 1.44 log n, our bound is 1.5 log n, so maybe 8% difference. We can represent our ranks in roughly log log n bits, whereas they need log n bits. Uh, so this is kind of a simplification of the treep data structure. And if you really want to eliminate ties in ranks, there is a, a way to add additional, fra a fractional part to the rank with an additional constant number of bits that preserves this uh, efficiency, log log n bits per rank, that uh, makes them definitely better than, uh, than trees. Uh, Aragon and Zy Seidel also um, used rotations to do their their updates, but I think just this unzipping and zipping process uh, is simpler and it's more efficient because it changes fewer pointers. If you localize things in terms of rotations, there are redundant pointer changes that don't need to be done. Uh, and actually Sprugnoli in 1980 in a very obscure paper suggested this unzipping strategy, but his work was so obscure it was never uh, uh, it never got the publicity it deserved. More interestingly, a zip tree is a binary representation of a skip list. There's an alternative logarithmic randomized search structure called a skip list invented by Pew, and I somehow the date disappeared here. And it's a beautiful notion. The idea is that you take the list structure and you, ran, you produce random sublists. So we have our list three, four, seven, and so on. We flip a coin for each node, and if it comes up heads, we promote the node to the next list up. So the level zero sublist contains everything. The level one sublist contains roughly half the items. We keep going until we run out of uh, items. So in this example, we've got all the items at the level zero list, and this is a picture I got off the web again by Igor Ostrovsky. There's a dummy node on the front and a dummy node on the back, which helps in the search process. This is the zero level list, which contains all the items. These items, 3, 7, 14, and 17, got picked to be at the level one list. Items 7 and 17 got to be picked at the level two list. And there's nobody at level three, although if the probability is a half here, you would expect one of these guys to have been promoted to the next level. So to search in this structure, you start out at the top left, keep going until you overshoot. Suppose we're searching for 13. We go to seven, we need to go farther. 17 is an overshoot. Back up, go down a level, go to 14, that's an overshoot. Back up, drop down to seven. 12, 13, we found our item. It's a nice data structure conceptually, but in implementation, it has this annoying feature that the, the nodes as I've drawn them have variable size depending upon how many levels a given data item has to sit in. So either you need to represent this with extra pointers or you need variable size nodes or you need a node size that's big enough to accommodate the maximum list level, which could be logarithmic. It turns out there's a one-to-one -one mapping between this data structure and the zip trees as I've described them. And the zip trees eliminate a bunch of the pointers and speed up searches by a constant factor. So you can think of zip trees as a efficient representation of a skip list if you like skip lists. So to summarize, the insertions and deletions are simple and efficient. Forget about rotation cases. Expected constant restructuring time for each insertion and deletion. You can do all the restructuring purely top down, which is again an advantage in a concurrent setting. 
They're history independent. There is no restructuring on accesses, unlike splay trees. There's no um, hot spot at the root. Uh, they're like skip lists, but it's a more efficient representation. And there is a way to support frequency biased access. So if we want more frequently accessed items to be closer to the root, so they're cheaper to access, all we have to do is each time we access an item, we generate a new rank for it. And if its new rank is bigger than its old rank, we move the item up in the tree correspondingly. And these movements will happen exponentially less often as the item gets higher, higher in the tree. But this will guarantee the correct frequency biased access properties. Um, so I think this is an especially nice candidate for a concurrent data structure. And recently I've been working on um, trying to come up with a good concurrent implementation in a very general model of concurrency in which you have multiple processors, but you don't know what their relative speeds are and you don't know if they're um, reliable. So you won't need to be able to account for an arbitrary processor dying and just dropping its operation on the floor. Now, if it drops its operation on the floor, it doesn't matter. But if it starts its operation and then it dies, somebody else has to pick up the, the workload. This is the non-blocking um, notion of concurrency, which has become quite, um, uh, quite hot these days. So it looks like zip trees are a good candidate for a non-blocking concurrent version of search trees. And I'm optimistic that one can prove nice complexity bounds as well as get a simple, correct algorithm. So I see I'm out of my time here. Let me just say thank you again. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for explaining so complex concepts in simpler manner. And that was your talk. So thank you so much for that. It was really enlightening. So I have two questions. Uh, first is, uh, we live in an era now wherein we are talking about predictive analytics and a lot of tools which are out there, which are using algorithms intelligently for doing predictions. So any advice you have using your research in algorithms, how we can get better at that? And my second question is, we live in an era now wherein people are saying, and I've read a lot of articles, wherein future wars are, being, are, are going to be fought using artificial intelligence and more importantly, algorithms. So what is your take on that? <laughs> well, one answer I'll, I'll attribute to Marty, which is that I don't know anything about those areas, so I might want to beg off. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let me offer a couple more thoughts. You know, I always, I think of algorithms as beautiful things. I think of algorithm as a good word, but lots of people now think of algorithm as a dirty word, and it's for this very reason. We have all these predictive systems, and even though they produce uh, useful results, they're easy to fool. There was the discussion this morning about this fact that even though these neural net systems, uh, if you don't run an adversary against them, they can do very well, you can fool them. And this is extremely dangerous. I think we have to understand the social consequences of what we do. So I leave it to all of you young people to uh, try to figure out how we deal with this. I think it's a challenging problem. We need to understand the effects of our actions and the systems we're building and so on. It's very important. I mean. Technology has this flavor, right? We plunge heedless into the technological future and we get lots of unintended consequences. Let's try to understand the consequences of what we do. It's certainly critical. So we'll take just the one more question because we're just running short on time. So in this uh, blockchain era, whether this tree is, is still relevant or will be relevant? Uh, people still use databases. 
So I think fundamental data structures will be relevant at least for the rest of my lifetime. I don't know about the rest <laughs> of your lifetime. Although, you know, there was a, uh, I think blockchains are extremely fascinating, maybe not cryptocurrencies, but um, <laughs> now what did I want to say? Oh yes, Jeff Dean and some of his colleagues have a paper in which they were learning uh, uh, parameters to tune a neural net to do searching. So maybe these data structures will become obsolete. I guess I'm a skeptic of that work. I think it's uh, a misapplication of neural nets. But who knows? Who knows? OK, so please join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor Bob Sarkin. And this is a moment from ACM India. Thank you. I'm not speaking. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, final keynote speaker for today. So Moshe Vardi. Um, so it's uh, pointless to tell you what you can read about him. So uh, Moshe works in areas which overlap with mine. Uh, he started a lot of his work in theoretical aspects of databases moving naturally into logic and automata theory. And so uh, he was, in some sense, a large part of my education. And uh, just his output is pretty intimidating. What is even more scary is watching him in a conference, because he will always sit in the front row, and he will listen to every talk, and he will always have an intelligent question at the end of it. And you feel so, so insignificant. It's much worse, of course, if you're speaking and you're asked that question. So when I first met him in 1998, when he came to Chennai for a workshop on finite model theory along with our theory conference, FSTTCS. And one of the early things that happened on that conference was that uh, it was held in, I mean, doesn't matter, but it was held in the Institute of Mathematical Sciences and nearby is a place called the Theosophical Society. So one day Moshe said, I will visit the Theosophical Society and come back for dinner. And people asked him how it went. And he said, oh, it was fine. How did you go? We went, oh, I went to Kanoto. How much did you pay? And he had paid a ridiculously small amount. And if you don't, if you've never been to Chennai, uh, Chennai autos are amongst the most you know, criminal people in the world. <laughs> so he said, how did you manage that? Oh, I just got in, and I put my hand, and I turned the meter, and I said, let's go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so this only reinforced my uh, highly uh, scary image of Moshe. <laughs> not a man to mess with, <laughs> but I came to know him better, and uh, he's a really nice guy. So don't be fooled by all this. He's a really nice guy. Now, of course, as uh, Vicky said this morning, uh, one of the things that in, in the ACM context, which he is most remembered for now, is the last 10 years. In 2008, he took over as the editor of CACM. So CACM has been, if you have been following the talks, one of the flagship publications of the ACM. Many of the pioneering results in the, in the field were published in CACM. And then I think it kind of went into a period of, I wouldn't say decline, but possibly less visible. But I think Moshe has redesigned, reinvented it, and made it really a vehicle to convey not just uh, you know scientific ideas, but also make them accessible and make computing as a subject more accessible to the, both the people working in computer science and also people who are not necessarily working in computer science. And I think it's been a remarkable transformation over the last 10 years. He just stepped down in 2017. And one of the things that you can see if you follow some of the uh, editorials he has written is that computing over this period has also transcended the boundaries of what we think of it as a science, which is kind of self-contained and dealing with information processing and efficiency and all these other reliability and stuff. So he has 
initiated debates about topics like open access publishing, plagiarism, the relevance of things like university rankings. So, so there is a definite kind of trend in this larger context to see how computing and other things impact the world at large. And this is the theme of his talk today. As you can see, it says, human, machines, and work, the future is now. So welcome, Moshe. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, I've been to India many, many times. Uh, this visit, however, is somewhat special because I got to do something I've never done before. I went on a tiger safari. <laughs> so this is, this is, this is Kana National Park. Who can see the tiger? <laughs> Raise your hand if you can see the tiger. There's no tiger. <laughs> so for, for the first day, no tiger. Second day, no tiger. But for the third day, we saw a tiger. <laughs> now on a more serious note. What we have seen, in, and even we saw it very nicely in, in the last talk by, by Bob Tarzan, how we start from algorithms and we end up thinking about societal consequences. And in some sense, this is my own personal path. If you look what I've done for the past 35 years, I was at the first 30 years, I only want to publish papers and get them cited. If you don't know, this is the Google Scholar page. That's what many computer scientists, the only thing they care about. But then a couple of years ago, I find myself quoted in The Guardian by an article about sex robots. I hope nobody is offended. I'll quickly pass over. <laughs> and I was cited by about a thousand newspapers on the topic of sex robots. So many of my friends start calling me sex robots, Moshe. <laughs> so how did it happen? Let me explain to you how it happened. So for this, we have to go back to perhaps the one of our founding, founding figures, Alan Turing. This is a sculpture that you can find at Bletchley Park in the UK. And uh, many of you know of Alan Turing because of Turing machines, but his most cited paper is not the paper about Turing machines, which was 1936, but the paper from 19, 1950, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Now that paper has become most, most famous for the wrong reason. And uh, anybody knows what is this picture? the imitation game, which has become also known as the Turing test. But that actually is the weakest part of the paper. The majority of the paper is a philosophical examination of the question, can machines be intelligent? The Turing test was an attempt to define intelligence. And Turing answered positively. He thinks the machine will be intelligent. In fact, he thinks they will be become intelligent by the end of the century. Well, the century has come and passed. Our machine intelligence now we can debate it, okay? They're more powerful, they're faster, are the intelligence, it's a matter of debate. So Turing perhaps was too optimistic. And in fact, this early optimism was a feature of the field. You go to the very beginning of AI as a research area, 1958, and they saw that computerized chess will take at most 10 years. Marvin Minsky, again, one of the pioneers in AI, yeah, give us a generation, which is, let's say 30 years to solve the problem of, of AI. And because of this over-optimism, there were periods of crisis for AI. They would become known as AI winters between the mid-70s and 1980, and then in during the mid-80s and the 90s. When I was a, a young researcher, AI has a somewhat unsavory uh, reputation as a field that over-promises and under-delivers. And a milestone that I think changed much of this was 1997, when an IBM program, Deep Blue, beat Kasparov in chess. Uh, I, was, I, I started my career at IBM Research, and then I moved to Rice in 1993, but I had good relationship with IBM, so they invited me to, to watch the game. They paid my flight, they paid the hotel, I couldn't say no. <laughs> so I go to the first game, in the first game, uh, Kasparov wins. And Kasparov was white in the first game, and white is perceived to have an advantage. 
Second game, Kasparov is black, Deep Blue is white. Kasparov n has to be more aggressive. He lays a very elaborate trap to Deep Blue. Deep Blue not only does not fall into this trap, but comes out of it in a move that was so brilliant that Kasparov refused to, be to admit that he lost to a computer. For many years, he argued there was a team of grandmasters playing against him. <laughs> Only last year, which was the 20th anniversary, he published a book, and he finally admitted, yes, I lost to a machine. Here you can see him walking away after he considered the game, the second game. The unfortunate thing for me was after the first game, I said, well, one day computers will win, but I guess the time has not come, and I decided to cut my, sh my trip short and go back to Houston, and I missed this historical game. I regret it forever. Now, another breakthrough came up in 2011, again IBM, this time a program called Watson. Now, if you hear anything about IBM, IBM is what's on this and what's on that, right? <laughs> so, in 2011, Watson defeated uh, the two best players at the time in jeopardy. Now, chess, we always, even you can see, 1958, people thought the chess is just a mechanical game. It's just a matter of searching deep enough in the search tree. But, but Jeopardy requires knowledge of culture and history and putting things together in a clever way. This was really a, a real coup for a program to beat human players in Jeopardy. And that was the point in which I started thinking, you know, I work in, in an area called automated reasoning, which is part of AI. And I always believe that there's nothing unique about the brain. It's a, it's, we can debate what is a computer or not, but it's, I'm a materialist, so I don't see why we should not ultimately be able to build a computer which will be able to compete with the brain. But I always thought the time is very far, sometime in a very far future. In 2011, it suddenly seemed, wow, it doesn't seem that far away. And I want to mention another breakthrough which happened two years ago. This was in 2016. And now it's a Google program called AlphaGo. And it beat Lee Sedol, a Korean, uh, uh, very, very, you know, I think he was a champion. In, uh, in Go. Now Go is different than chess in the following way. It's a simpler game. The board is bigger, there are only black and white pieces, there are no different type of pieces. Therefore, this, the, the space of possible configurations is much larger. And therefore, a just brute force search like, like Deep Blue did in chess never will work. Even today, computers cannot do full search of Go. So AlphaGo used research techniques, we heard a lot here about research techniques, but in addition, Alpha, AlphaGo used what we heard in the second talk, used deep learning. And AlphaGo, first of all, digested all published games of Go, and then on top of it, AlphaGo played millions of games against itself and built a deep, deep learning model for what are good configurations and good moves. And in some sense, uh, what AlphaGo did is the way human players play. If you ask Lee Sedol, how do you play? He won't tell you, oh, I know that in this situation you do this. He has deep intuition. And AlphaGo developed deep intuition. The fact that today machine can develop intuition answer an objection to AI that was voiced by the philosopher Polanyi more than 50 years ago. <laughs> and Polanyi, this became known as the Polanyi paradox. Polanyi says, we know much more than we know how to describe. How many people here know how to ride a bicycle? Please raise your hand. Good. How many people here can ride a set of rules how to keep yourself balanced on a bicycle? <laughs> you just do it, right? You don't know how you do it. You just do it. The same thing with driving. You just do it. You don't have a set of rules. And this was thought, how can we program a computer to drive a car if we don't know how to, how we drive a car? And now we have an answer. We are going to learn how to drive cars, the same way that we learn how to play Go. And in fact, this lead to an, a project that's been going on now for more than a decade to automated driving. So in 2005, there was a DARPA grand challenge and a group from Stanford led by Sebastian Trun was able to drive uh, almost 200 kilometers in, in desert, uh, desert Valley. And a year later, uh, uh, two years later, a team from CMU was able to do it in, in Pittsburgh, an automated car. And now, everybody knows what this is. What is this? Is? What is this? The Google car, the Waymo car. 
So I want to explain to you that automated driving will be the biggest technological thing that you are going to see in your lifetime. Nothing else is comparable to it. To put it in context, let's go back to in history, talk about transportation revolution. 5,000 years BC, the invention of the, of the wheel, probably in India. <laughs> the Egyptians would not have been able to build the pyramids if they did not have the wheel to carry these large, large boulders, okay? Then about 1,500 years later, the domestication of the horse, again, somewhere in probably in Central Asia, if you want to do, until then, if you want to go somewhere, you had to walk somewhere. Now, using the horse, the Mongols were able to go from Mongolia all the way practically to Europe and build the largest land empire ever. And then this was, this is still 3,500 years BC. And for more than 5,000 years, nothing much happened in land transportation until we have the development of the steam locomotive. If you want to understand the importance of, st of, of the steam locomotive, you look at the United States of America, which is what we call a continental country, right? The country is a whole, you go from the west coast to the east coast. And in, in 1860, if you want to go from New York to San Francisco, how did you, what was the shortest route? A boat all the way around America. And then in, in a matter of, uh, of a short number of years, they put all these uh, railroads and the United States became a unified country in some sense. And then about a century later, there was a Ford Model T. The Ford Model T is not the first automobile. Automobile were by, by then about 50 years old, but it was a mass produced, mass sold car. It became something that middle class people could buy. And it gave us this. <laughs> and this, and this. To understand the significance of the automobile, you have to ask yourself, what is the most significant industrial product of the 20th century. So we think, oh, for sure the computer. No, the computer will be the most significant product of the 21st century, but it was still a very young with limited impact in the 20th century. The automobile shaped the US economy. It shaped US, the US geography. It gave rise to US industry that made the United States a superpower. And just you have to think how many movies describe the automobile as a symbol of freedom and adulthood. And this is all going to change because of the automation of the car. And the reason that this will happen is because the automobile come up with a horrible societal cost that we have simply learned to accept as this is act of God. Every year, about 1.25 million people get killed in car crashes. The property damage is enormous. Most of this affects people in the middle of their life. And who's responsible? You want to know who's responsible? Look to your right, look to your left. <laughs> You'll find the people who are responsible for it. <laughs> we are terrible drivers. <laughs> it's all up to us. I do an experiment sometime in class. I ask everybody to write on a piece of paper, are they above average driver or below average driver? And then I ask everybody who is above average to raise their hand. 80% of the people are above average. So there is a, a bit of a gold rush atmosphere now in Silicon Valley around the, the, the automation of driving. We don't know exactly, but over 250 companies are working on it. You have the automobile company, GM, Ford, they're all trying to keep their business, uh, way more, maybe Apple, maybe Baidu, we don't know which technology company are working on it. For sure, Uber and Lyft, and these companies are working on it, many, many startups. There is kind of a debate how close we are to solving the problem, the technical problem. Some people said five years, some people said 15 years, some people said 25 years. The legal, there are huge legal issues. For example, in most of the state, United States, the law says if the car is moving, a person has to sit in the car. So the laws will have to change. There will be a huge business impact because there are now whole industries are built on car crashes. One of them, is an industry that we think is very positive, which is organ transplants, transplantation. Where do you get organs? People who, who die in car crashes. <laughs> what will happen to all these people if suddenly we are eliminating accidents? <laughs> On the other hand, it's very clear that this will be of huge societal benefit by saving lives, 
and many people who are now immobile will be liberated and be able to become mobile when they can just call a car and, and go anywhere they want for a low price. But now I want you to look at this, this uh, figure. This shows the most common job category in every state of the United States. And you can see that in the majority of the states, the most common job is truck driver. There are about 4 million truck and taxi driver in the United States. There are 15 million jobs where the main task is driving. Think of a, a postal delivery worker. That you don't think of this person typically as a driver. But what does this person do? Drives around and does package delivery. So we know that, that the millions of these jobs will be, will be eliminated when we automate driving. If you automate driving, you can automate the whole what we call logistical supply chains. The ports can be automated because the ports are mostly now dealing with containers, so they can be automated. Uh, cargo, cargo boats can be automated. In fact, it's much easier to do it for cargo boats because um, you know, here in the United States, we're worried about kids jumping in front of a car. In India, you have to worry about the monkeys jumping in front of the car. <laughs> With, with, the, with cargo boats, you don't have to worry about this. So it's fairly clear that sometimes in the next 25 years, there will be a huge disruption to, to, this, to the labor market because of automation of driving. And just even think, if you, again, if you know the United States, because of it's a large country, there are whole industries that, uh, that are around the driving, motels, restaurants, and so on and so forth. So the standard answer is there. Yes, technology will eliminate jobs, but not to worry, it will create new jobs. That's the standard what you hear from economists. And I want to examine that. And so here is Ken Rogoff, is a, is, a, is a economist in Harvard, call himself a neoclassical economist, and basically saying, look, people always said that technology will cause mass unemployment. It never happens, nothing to worry about. This is what you hear. What you used to hear, and uh, we'll see whether what you hear now. But this was the standard convention line from economists. Technology will create new jobs. We don't know what they are, nothing to worry about. But then you have other economists. Paul Krugman is a very famous Nobel Prize winning economist who is famous also because he writes for the New York Times. And he writes, can innovation and progress really hurt large number of workers, maybe even workers in general? The truth is that it can. And serious economists have been aware of this possibility for almost two centuries. So there is a debate going on between economists. The new Luddites are saying, this time it is different. The neoclassical economy says, no, it is not different. Who is right? This has now become a hot topic. Almost every month there is a new study. McKinsey, Gartner, Oxford, OECD, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Every study comes up with a different conclusion. Here is a recent quote from Technology Review magazine. There are about as many opinions as there are experts. <laughs> so why are there so many different predictions? Well, because predictions are easy, especially about the future. <laughs> why they're easy? Go ahead, make predictions. Make a prediction what will happen in 70 years, who's going to prove that you are wrong? <laughs> Cor correct predictions are difficult. So instead of making predictions, which is a risky business or easy business, depending how you look at it, <laughs> let's look at the past. I'm going to, that's why I said, the future is now. I'm going to look at the past. Come to look what happened over the past generation. And for the case study, I'm going to use US manufacturing. Why US manufacturing? First of all, the US, is a very unregulated economy, relatively speaking. <laughs> so it's, and the US is a huge economy, 25% of the whole world GDP is the United States. And it's an economy that pretty much what we call less fair economy. So we can see how the market works, as opposed to some economies in Europe that are much more, um, there's much more government involvement. And as you can see, the US sector is the largest sector in the US economy, by far, almost twice as big as the next sector, which is gov government. And to get an idea of the size of US manufacturing, it is about as big as Germany, Korea, France, Russia, Brazil, and the UK combined. Huge sector of the economy. 
Okay, now see type. Here is the most important uh, chart of this lecture. So this shows you US manufacturing output, how much are the US, is the US producing versus jobs. And when you look at output, you do it in what we call constant dollar to adjust for inflation. So what do you see here? This is the output. So somewhere, you know, if you just listen to some politician, you may think there's no more manufacturing in the United States. Everything went to China or Mexico. But this is complete myth. This is completely not true. You, you can see the U.S. is manufacturing more than ever before. This is the, the financial crisis that happened in the last few years. So, but we are coming out of it. So we are now at what people call, call, call peak manufacturing, manufacturing about $2 trillion a year. What about employment? Here you can see uh, employment peaked in nine, around 1980. And it's been going down since then. Here's another way to look at this. This says U.S. manufacturing as a share of the total GDP. And you can see it's pretty much fixed. The U.S., it's about uh, something like 12% of, of the whole U.S. economy is manufacturing, and it's very, very stable. What about employment? It used to be 25%. And now it's below 10%. So we're manufacturing as much as we ever manufactured before, but we're doing it with fewer people. Why? Because of productivity. Because manufacturing has become much, much more productive. It has doubled over the past 20 years. If you want to see how manufacturing looks today, all you have to do is go to YouTube and Google Tesla Model S factory. And what you will see is, this is just a still, but you can see beautiful videos of Tesla manufacturing floor, all these industrial robots. What you do not see here, what don't you, what don't you see here? No people. In fact, why do you think they turn on the light? So they can take the picture. <laughs> in effect, there used to be an old joke in General Motors, in an, going back to the 1960s. The joke wa went like this. The factory of the future will be all robots plus one person and one dog. What is the role of the person? To feed the dog. <laughs> what is the role of the dog? To make sure the person does not touch the machines. <laughs> so now we have a perfect case study for automation. US manufacturing has largely been automated. So what happened to these people? So again, neoclassical theory would tell you, no problem, these people found other jobs, everything worked out. And this, the answer was what I'm going to show you now in excruciating details is that this is not the case. Things did not work out for working class people. And especially, I, I, I know less about India, so I'm hesitant to say it, but the United States, we have a societal divide. Uh, you may have heard about the 1%, but the real deeper divide is the top maybe 20% who are educated professionals and other, and other 80%. Because if you are an educated professional, who are your friends? Educated professionals. Whom are you going to marry? Educated professionals. What are your children, children going to be? Educated professionals. So you live in educated professional bubble and you think everything is going great. So let's see what happened to working class people and what I want to show you, that at least for developed economies, and I'm focusing you on the US, we'll come back to India at the very, very end. India is a different country. I'll come back to it. We have a serious policy challenge on our hand. So let's look at some, some data. So there are kind of four key economic statistics that you need to follow to understand what's going on. One is productivity. How, how does an economy grow? An economy grows either because there are more people all people are becoming more productive. That's how economy grows. So typically we say that productivity growth drives economic growth. So productivity growth drives GDP growth. What you see here is between about roughly for 30, 40 years after World War II, labor productivity, which is the blue line grew, and GDP grew, and jobs were created, and income has risen. So overall, the country has become better off. There are more jobs, people are making more money. This is what people like to see. The future is better than, than, than the past. And so people almost thought that these are 
the fact that these four numbers move together, these four lines move together, this must be an economic law. Except it turns out that it doesn't. So here is what happened after that. We see here that productivity continued to grow and the economy continued to grow, GDP continued to grow, but we're not genera generating as many jobs and income has not risen much. This is, wow, and this has become known as the great decoupling. Here is a chart that makes me gasp, and there are three charts here that I will show you that I, when I saw them, I gasp. What does this show? This is real, real mean again, constant dollars, adjusted for inflation, median income of white men with no college degree. And what you see here, that their income between 75 and, and, and 2015, over 40 years, their income has declined. Once you adjust for inflation, income has declined. Now, when you see this, you know, if you have watched a little TV over the past couple of years, you might have seen some political rallies, and you, just, you saw people, you typically men, angry, right? Uh, uh, really angry. <laughs> now, we used to see such angry men, typically they were in the Middle East, and they used to say, death to the United States. Now, we find angry men in the United States, and you could ask, what are they so angry about? Well, this kind of tells you what they're angry about. They're angry because their income has really declined and they know it and they feel it. And we've been hearing also more and more about inequality. So just to show you uh, what happened with inequality, this is again 1980 to 2013. And this is what happened to the, to the bottom 90%. They've actually lost ground. And this is what happened to the top 1% of top 1%. They have done like gangbusters, as they say. Okay, so this is growing inequality. To put it in even sharper terms, this chart looks at what happened to the, the, the bottom 50% and the top 1%. And you can see that in 1962, the, the, the top 1% earned, what is it, about 13% uh, of the income. And the bottom 50 er earned about 20% of the income. And as we go along, you can see who is doing well, the top 1%, and now they're making about 20%. And the bottom 50% are now making about 12%. So there's growing inequality, and growing inequality feeds a growing sense of social, social injustice, and people are angrier and angrier about it. Here is e even, again, to me, a very shocking way to look at it. So there is something called, you may have heard the phrase, American dream. The American dream thinks that if I work hard, if I study and I work hard, I will do better and my children will do better. So indeed, if you look in 1940, if you are 30 years old, the probability you are doing better than your parents when they were of the same age was 90%. You have very, very high likelihood of doing better than your parents. What is it now? It's about 50%. You might as well toss a coin. You might be doing better than your parents or worse than your parents. This is the end of the American dream. And here is gasp number two. So you might have heard a lot about how the US now has very low unemployment. What is unemployment? Unemployment measures how many people are looking for a job and not finding a job. And that is now around, around 4%, so it seems very low. But you understand about ratios. There are two ways to make this ratio smaller. One is more people finding jobs. The other one is fewer people looking for jobs. So the labor force participation rate measures how many people are working or looking for a job. That means they're in the job market. And what we're seeing here, that this is, here we're talking about men between ages 25 and 54. So they're not going to school usually, unless they're taking a very long time to get a PhD. <laughs> and they're too early to retire yet. So this is really, it's called prime age. It used to be, you can see that in this group, 97% used to be in the labor force. And you can see this has been going down now for 50 years, and it's now around 88%. But this hides the even more scary picture, which is what happens if you look by education. If you look by education, you find that if you have a bachelor degree, there is also some decline in the labor force participation rate. But from 98 to 96, not very significant. But if you have high school degree or less, and you have to understand, in the United States, only 30% of the population has a four-year college degree. 
if you have only high school degree or less, now the labor, the, you, it went down to 82%. And what it means is that if you look at men without college education, about one in five or maybe even one in four is not working. This is a huge societal crisis. This is what we think typical of a country in a, in a deep state of, a, of economic depression. And we find another uh, uh, indicator that shows us that labor has declined. You look at the economy and you say how much of the GDP is capital and how much is labor. And for many years it used to be 50-50. And you got the impression that there must be balance. And again, we can see here that over the past, the past 40 years, there is a decline. Labor is losing ground. Companies are investing in capital, in buying equipment, but don't, and they're not investing in creating jobs. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that automation, where does automation eat jobs? So think about it. At the very high end, people who give talks at ASEAN India events, it's quite difficult to automate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what about the very low end? Cleaning, cleaning the, 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 the plates after we ate out there. It's actually going to be very, very, very difficult to build a robot to do that. Because think of what you need by way of agility and dexterity and situational awareness. It's very difficult to automate it. I don't think there is any roboticist who says, I can build a robot to clean tables in a restaurant. On the other hand, let's be honest, we're not paying these people that much. So it makes no economic sense to automate it. So what happened is, this is what happened here. This is the middle, this is the high end of the skill spectrum. This is the low end. And this is in the middle that we will automate jobs. Where do, where do we automate jobs? These jobs are maybe, a, a, a for example, a in, a <coughs> in manufacturing, and the jobs are fairly routine, and they're paid maybe 20 to $30 an hour, and that's where we are losing, losing jobs. We are making, we are creating jobs here, creating jobs here, we are losing jobs here in the middle, in what we call the routi routine jobs. And indeed, if you look at the uh, real hourly wages, you can see here that people with advanced degrees, their wages are rising, People with college degree, it's going okay. But people, for example, with high school degree or less, the wages are going down. And this is a statistic, the data that came up just a couple of years ago. And this has to do with, uh, with mortality. So generally, health, go get health gets better and better, and mortality is supposed to decline. Turns out one group, which is, uh, if, if you again look at this group, this is white people with high school degree or less. And you see mortality is actually going up. So you can ask what are people dying from? And it turns out you may have heard about opioid epidemic. They're dying from drug overuse, from suicide, from uh, over drinking. And in fact, all of the, <laughs> all of the two, two years ago, the Washington Post has shown there is a correlation. If mortality is up, you're more likely to vote for Trump. The, the, the the, the rhyming came up uh, accidentally. Now, all of these data show that something is going on. What is happening? What is the cause? There is a difference between correlation and causation. And so is it caused by automation or something else? So in 2014, there was a poll am am among about uh, 2,000 e economists. And there, there was a plurality that automation is a central reason for this uh, stagnation. This was 2014. Already by, by last year, some new data came out and they showed that the more robots are deployed, the, the more jobs are actually being destroyed. And then, again, last year, Laura Tyson, who is a distinguished economist at Berkeley, already wrote in an article, among economists, however, the consensus is that about 80% of the loss of US manufacturing jobs was the result of labor saving and technological change with trade coming a distant second. So what we've been hearing is all about trade. It's nonsense. The, the, the main factor is growing automation. So what about this argument that uh, technology destroys jobs, but it creates new jobs? So what, what kind of new jobs it does create? Jobs where we can compete with machines. We have to outcompete the machines. But 
the machines are getting better and better and better. Are we going to be able always to outcompete them? Think of the, the success, is the, uh, what is the ultimate story is which we will be able to automate everything. What will we do then? And so the other thing to remember is the, there is a concept of the tipping point. Tipping point is in a physics term phase transition. There was a famous book in 2000, more than 10 years ago by Melvin Gladwell called Tipping Point. When I was a child, we used to get uh, milk that has to be, had to be boiled, and my mother would put it and told me to watch it. And I was standing there, I would watch it, and then I would start looking around, and the milk will always boil over. <laughs> this is called the tipping point. <laughs> what, is, what is the tipping point economically? The Industrial Revolution, by far. The Industrial Revolution was a huge phase transition, a huge tipping point. Imagine you're an economist, the year is 1700, and somebody asks you to predict economic growth for the next uh, 100 years. You look back, you say, well, I have behind me more than 1,000 years of economic data where economic growth was maybe 0.1% per year. So you make a very confident prediction. Economic growth will be another 0.1% per year for the next 100 years. But of course, you're going to be very wrong because the Industrial Revolution happened, and we're all enormously richer because of it. So this is a phase transition. Now you can imagine two horses. The year is 1910. And these two co horses are eating straw and having intelligent conversation. And one horse asks the other one, have you heard about the Ford Model T? The other one chews and says, yes, yes, I've heard about the Ford Model T. So the first horse says, I'm very worried. If these cars really take off, what will horses do? And the, the neoclassical horses, not to worry. Technology always destroys jobs for horses, but it creates new jobs. There will be new jobs that we cannot yet even imagine, not to worry. So which horse, which horse was right? This is a parable written by, by a Nobel Prize winning economist, Vasily Leontiev. Obviously, we know which horse was, was right, the worried horse, the new Ludwig Holt was right because horse population picked up in the U.S. in 1915, has gone down since. There are no jobs for horses. Horses are pets. There are no jobs for horses. That's it. It's over for horses. So, so this idea there will always be new jobs is a fantasy. Now you can say, okay, but the National Revolution happened and everything worked out. So nothing to worry about. But this is ignoring history. Of course, yes, it's true that things worked out. It took 200 years for things to work out. The, the, the response to the Industrial Revolution was the emergence in the West of the social welfare state, which is really the dominant model in the actually any developed country today, is a social welfare economy. It took 200 years for this model to mature. What happened in the meantime? There were two major revolutions. You know what is the co human cost of these two communist revolutions? About 100 million people. In fact, people didn't forget history in the United States how violent it was. There were violent strikes. This is the, the Pittsburgh Railroad riots where you see the train station burning, 60 people killed by police. Uh, people forget labor strife was very, very violent, even in the United States. And in fact, we avoided having a revolution in the West by inventing the social welfare state. So yes, technology will destroy jobs and technology will create new jobs but it doesn't tell us anything about the, the balance between them. Will it create enough new jobs? Will it create them fast enough? What about the skill level? Suppose you, you take one of these, we talked about the truck drivers, they lose their jobs because now we have automating this. And you tell the truck driver, I'm sorry to tell you, your job as a driver is gone, but I have a new job for you. We need more people to write software for these automated uh, trucks. How many truck drivers can we train to write software for automated trucks? It's going to be a challenge. Okay? Even, even the issue is right now we have a problem with coal miners. They're losing jobs in the place in the United States when there is coal mining. And you can tell them, okay, you should move to other cities where there are more jobs. They can't afford to move because housing in the, in the places where there are no jobs is very cheap. And housing where there are jobs is very expensive. These people cannot afford to move. If you go to the places today that are in economic boom, like San Francisco, real estate prices are just in the sky high today. 
In fact, here is a, there was an article, this is from the world, uh, just recently, the World Economic Forum, about all these new jobs that will be created. I mean, amazing jobs, right? Worldview trainer, context designer. I don't even know what these jobs mean. <laughs> but there's one, for one thing I know for sure. Automation economist is not a job for someone with only high school education. That I'm quite sure. And let's talk about the number of jobs. So go back to, to 1990, not that far in the past. Look at Detroit, which used to be the center of the US economy, of the car, eco car uh, economy. And you find three companies, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. The market value is $65 billion. They employed more than a million people. Then you go to Silicon Valley, you take the big three companies, which is Alphabet, uh, Apple, and, uh, and uh, Facebook. Now, 2016, they had a market valuation of one and a half trillion dollars, and they employ fewer than two, 200,000 workers. So you can, you, you can have a huge economic growth, but you don't create enough jobs. Now, it's very regrettable that we had two years ago, we had the election. And did you hear Trump talk about automation? Nope. Did you hear Clinton talk about automation? No. In fact, the only politician who was talking about automation was one who was not running for any position. It was President Obama, and he said automation is happening. People are moving from good manufacturing jobs to jobs in services that are paying about half, half that much. It's a huge problem. And he says we will have to re-examine the social compact. What is the social compact? Is this uh, in, uh, agreement that we, uh, unwritten agreement that we have, have that we have that, me, that, that governs our whole working life. And if you look at what today, the, st the, the standard in developing countries, you find many issues today that you take for granted, but each one was a huge struggle. So the right to strike, which now we take as granted, was a huge fight. We, you saw people were actually being shot over, over striking. The right to unionize, abolishing child labor, 40 hours work week, equal pay for women and minority, health and safety laws, and now there is a debate, there is a new idea that's been floated, it's called universal basic income, and it means that everybody, every citizen should get paid by the, by the state, a basi basic uh, income. It's an idea that has uh, supporters on the left and on the right, it has opponents on the left and on the right, and I already heard just uh, last week of a, a candidate for the presidency in, in 2020 that's going to run on the platform of universal basic income. So at least this issue of automation, I'm hoping, will become a topic of debate in the 2020 elections. And I want to, uh, to quote Jason Furman. Jason Furman was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisor of President Obama. In 2016, he wrote a report, and he wrote, my worry is not that this time could be different when it comes to AI, but that this time could be the same as what we've had for the past generation. Because if you just take the trends that we've seen of the past generation and you extrapolate them, then we don't need any singularity. We don't need any, some, some new fancy schmancy thing we talk about. Just extend the line that we've seen and it looks pretty grim. That means that we have a huge policy challenge that we are just maybe are going to start having a serious conversation about education, taxation, trade, housing, how to address the automation challenge. Now let me add, let me finish with some words about developing economies. So this is called the elephant chart. And this was uh, published a, a couple of years ago. What does the elephant chart shows? It shows, it looks at the whole world globally. It looks at the, at the income distribution across the whole world and show how people have benefited from it. And it looks like an elephant. This is the trunk, this is the hump. What you can see is that the low end People benefit a lot from globalization. In fact, we know that between just between China and India, about a billion people came out of deep poverty. I think deep poverty, I don't know exactly, but I think it means people make like one dollar a day or something like that. And billion people have come out of deep poverty. So this, this, is, this part is wonderful news for humanity. So for the people here, these are roughly the people in the lower half of the, of the income. For them, globalization was great. What happened here? The rich people in the West have done very well, but the middle class and working class people in the developed world have stagnated. 
If you want to understand politics, and you've heard about populism, you heard about you know, Trump in the United States, Brexit in, uh, in the UK, and other in other countries, this is an explanation. People are not happy about what happened. Now, what does the future mean for, for, uh, for developing economies? What does automation mean for developing economies? So how does a developing economy get out of being a very poor economy? The answer was they have to create an industry. And for example, what happened is, what happened is that like uh, manufacturing sneakers, this, is, this was used to be done manually, and it's not economical anymore to do it in developed countries. So all of this moved to countries where the lab labor is much cheaper. So first it moved to China, then China become too expensive, then it goes to Vietnam, it goes to Malaysia, it goes to other countries. What happened when we have robots that can make sneakers? What happened when we have robots that can make shirts? So the risk is to many countries what's called premature industri industrialization. That means that, that there, will be, there will be automation before jobs will be created for, for, uh, for very poor people. And so the same way that, so we shouldn't think that automation is only a challenge to develop economies, it's also a challenge to developing economies. Uh, for example, I'm hearing now that uh, in India, in the IT industry, there's all of be have been some layoffs. And one explanation is that the low, some of the low level jobs that used to be offshore are now autom already automated. Ro robotic process automation takes away jobs that used to be offshore. Thank you very much. A couple of questions. There's some microphone. No, no, Mike, Mike. Nobody's loud enough. <laughs> uh, hats off to you taking on a tough topic, very contextual to India. So I want to give a just a two minute background to what has happened in the last two generations for the success of even the company where you're working here is because of so-called IT services. And believe me, India has only been doing IT services and thanks to all the people who believed in IT services that has given jobs to all the workers out here, the previous generation and this generation. Had we relied only on the Apples and Googles, we would have the same problem. They go to measly IITs and IIITs take those five people in a year. But today, because of the services industry, we are able to employ the 125,000 people, at least in the top five, plus I think the next level of IT companies take the next 125,000. So we have at least close to 300,000 jobs created every year because of the IT services boom that happened in the last 40 years. I think had we gone the path of the apples or the Googles or the Microsofts, we would have been a poor country, believe me, only being the back office of these good countries. So thanks to all the IT services companies. And I think where we are hitting now is exactly that point, that services which have been the success for the society and for the whole industry, we are now facing AI in form of threat. If you just look at the number of jobs being offered by the big IT services companies in the last seven to eight years, just including the top 10 IT services companies, which is the biggest employers, the ripple effects are already emerging. In some states, like including Tamil Nadu, Telangana, and all that, 40% of the colleges have closed down because they're not getting enough seats for engineering. So I think what you're presenting is real for India too. So I'm just countering all the arguments about AI creating enough jobs, but actually what's happening is talk to companies who are working in RPA area already BPO industry is wiped out. You go to Gurgaon and you'd find out. 10 years back, the vibrant economy that it was for the BPO industry, believe me, 40% to 50% of the jobs are gone. So it's not that India is not unaffected. India is on the verge of, I don't know what it means. I am scared to see that Pittsburgh fire. But believe me, IT services jobs are coming down, engineering seats are coming down, and believe me, what I don't know what's in pay. In terms of really IT creating more jobs, I don't know. But I just wanted to understand what is US government doing about it? Here, 
on the other hand, I see that the government is creating AI task forces. Even yesterday, there was a task force created. I don't know who is advising them, which economist is advising them. But I being in the right in the midst of it, it's a scary scenario for the future generation of India. But the kids, I feel very pity for the kids and the industry. And I feel your suggestion on what should Indian government do will be very helpful. So I, I think that, thank you for these very insightful comments. <coughs> so, uh, you know, the, the answer is going to be, we need to sit down and start having, first of all, a serious conversation <coughs> about it and look at the facts and they're going to be different. I mean, they, they here, the, in, the, the economy here is very, very different than the American economy. And I don't know enough really to have a, a meaningful suggestion about what to do. But we have to start having this serious conversation about it. And we have not, we have so far we have not had it yet. So Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so brilliant question took away part of my question. Uh, so a lot of these things we assume that governments will come around and policies will be put in place. Uh, it seems, but the trouble is the number of people who we can really extrapolate what's happening is far, far fewer. Even in our community, number of people seeing this is much lesser. So what do we do? So one thing I would ask you is that there's so many people, especially in the hottest kids, deep learning, they use all these crowdsourcing platforms. Uh, web companies got ton of data annotated uh, through us uh, under the guise of security challenges and stuff like that. Uh, should there be now uh, ethics questions on who owns AI? Do people who land up annotating this do AI? Do we try to fix the problem closer to home before we try to dictate governments of the world how to go about fixing the problem? You know, there are, there are, there are various ideas that you hear about it now. You know, Bill Gates himself talked about taxing, taxing robots. I mean, if you want to go a bit a bit farther ahead, then there is, a, there is a question, you know, let's imagine what happened when we have as a, as a society, a uh, society where, where labor force participation rate is not 80%, but what happened if it's 20%? And, and what happened even if we solve the issue of somehow we give everybody universal basic income, but, but our economies are, div are depend on people buying stuff. That's how economy works, right? We need to make enough money to consume. Who is going to do all the consuming? So there are lots of questions, and I think if we, it's very hard to look, in my opinion, more than 25 years into the future. I have no idea what will happen in 25 years, okay? <laughs> I think we need to worry right now about the people right now. For example, it turns out this is also true in the United States. I'm sure it's also true in India. You may get out of a college, in, even in IT, and get a very good job, and you think, okay, I'm all set for life. What happened 20 years later? So in fact, just uh, recently, a uh, salary data came out and say that as you are coming out of college in IT, your salary increases until about mid 40s. Then it starts to go down because your skills are getting to become a bit rusty. And at least in the US, companies are not investing, investing anymore. I mean, they, they, they used to be very deep bound. I used to work for IBM. The idea is this is for life. This is like a Catholic marriage, you know? You work at IBM until you retire. And so the company invested in you. Now these bonds of loyalty have eroded and company says, why should we invest in these people? And so there is a real issue for many people in IT. How do they keep up with the skill? How do they keep moving up? Because the new technologies keep coming out. And by the time you are 45 and your salary is higher, it is cheaper to hire a new college graduate that have the fresher set of skills. And so I think before we worry what will happen when the singularity arrives, we need to worry what happens to people who are right now in the job market and we have many people here who are educators, many people who are students, and we need to think, how do we, how do we, how should we teach students now? How do we prepare now students for the career? And what will happen to our great grandchildren? I'm going to leave it to the young, younger people to figure it out when the time comes. So one last question at the back. A very good afternoon, sir. This is Gaurav. Uh, sir, actually, well, thank you for a very wonderful speech. Act I wanted to ask, I'm still unclear that what is your conclusion on, is automation good or bad? What is your ultimate conclusion? So let me ask you, is fire good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> so the history of humanity is the history of technology. Really, this is, if you look at the history of humanity, sometimes about a million years ago, 
we learn to uh, harness fire. You know, I don't think we learn how to start fire, but we learn to use fire. And as a result, uh, look at your jaw and look at some picture of Homo Neanderthal and to see they have this huge jaw. Why did they have such a big jaw? Because they have to spend half the day chewing, okay? And, and we eat cooked foods. Now, how many people die because of fire? So the, human, the, the, the story of human civilization is the story that technology is good and it's bad. And what we always have need to do is develop the, the, the societal wisdom to try to harness technology in a positive way and try to find a way to minimize the damage technology causes. And this was true for fire, it's true for automobile, it will be true for AI as well. So I, c I can see a lot of hands, I'm sorry, but I think that we have reached the end of the day and I think we need to, because some people also have uh, trains and flights to catch. So I'd like to thank Moshe for a truly insightful talk. Thank, thank you, you Moshe. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all. And I request uh, Shekhar Sarasrupa, the CEO of ACM India to so thank you. All the good things have to come to end sometime. So this, this is the time to appreciate the people who made these things possible. Not just these talks, but also showing tigers also. <laughs> so as you know, we started this three days back uh, and uh, almost four or five institutes were involved in arranging all this particular program and putting the things together. Uh, we started with uh, two workshops, uh, one faculty summit and one CS Patshala workshop at YCC. Then we moved to VNIT for the IRIS and also to come in on the same day for the ACMW event and finally came here for the annual event. So let me invite uh, volunteers from each of this institute and let us appreciate their efforts. Firstly, the people from YCC led by uh, Professor Kishore Bhoyer. I also invite Vicky to come on the stage to appreciate that. And also, the volunteers actually want their photographs with all the speakers. So may I request <laughs> Moshe, Bob, and Martin to come on the stage? And also, Madhavan. <laughs> Thanks. Now volunteers from VNIT uh, with Professor Umesh. Please <laughs> 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 <laughs>
now the volunteers from Cummings College. I think Sushma, Madam. And finally, volunteers from Persistent Systems. Vinit Kapoor, Sarang, one more Vinit, Lakshman. I also invite uh, Shekhar Patankar and Venki on this stage. big gang. Uh, let me invite the tiger person also. Is Varad here? Person who showed the tiger? <laughs> yes, he is here. Please come. So thank you. And now hand over to Madhavan for the closing remarks. So there's not much to say at the end of such a wonderful day, except to thank, uh, of course, all our great keynote speakers for having imparted so much to us. Thank you all for coming and uh, sharing this day with us, with ACM, and uh, hope to see many of you involved in ACM activities going forward. Uh, so we come to the end of one annual day, but of course we will have more, and the next annual event uh, is scheduled for around the same time, early February next year in Kochi. So hope to see you in Kerala, and till then, enjoy and compute. or